Welcome, everyone. Thank you for taking the time today to join us to learn how to transform your lukewarm leads into loyal customers. So this is the second webinar in our three-part series brought to you by Allegra Marketing Print Mail. To review how to find and amplify your brand uniqueness or to learn about the next webinar about how to wow your best customers, visit www.allegrawebinars.com. My name is Tiffany Moss with Allegra, and you'll hear from me throughout today's presentation. Before we get into it, I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping items. We'd love for you to get involved by either typing questions or comments into the chat box and joining in on the conversation by using the hashtag Allegra Webinars. And this session will be recorded and sent to you via email within the next week. So if you were able to join us for the first part of this series in March, you know we focused on the top of the funnel and talked about how to connect your brand with your audience, creating more awareness of your brand and what you do. Hopefully you've been able to put some of it into action and have started to create more connections between your brand and your audience. <coughs> Today we're going to take it a step further and focus on how to turning leads into loyal customers is more than just getting them to convert and is about the entire customer experience. We're excited to partner with Carla throughout this webinar series because understanding the customer journey is really the foundation to any successful marketing campaign. And there's nothing we enjoy doing more than helping our customers succeed. So with that being said, let's get right to it. I'd like to welcome our speaker for today, Carla Johnson. For those of you that are new here, Carla is a world-renowned speaker, author, and storyteller. Her work with Fortune 500 brands served as a foundation for the latest of her seven books. Experiences, the seventh era of marketing, sets a powerful new way for marketing to create value for businesses. Named one of the top 10 influencers in business-to-business -business marketing and one of the top 50 women in marketing, Carlo regularly challenges the conventional thinking. And she's here to help all of us transform our lukewarm leads into loyal customers. Welcome, Carla. Thank you, Tiffany, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on wherever in the world you are today. I just want to thank you for joining us because I am always delighted to spend time with Tiffany and my Allegro Print Marketing friends, and I really appreciate you spending time with us today to learn about the customer journey and a lot of other things that we're going to cover, and I'll uh, tip my hat a little bit. I have some secret advice toward the end of today's webinar that is the, I would say, the top question that I get from people about the customer journey. So as Tiffany said, we're going to talk about how great brands create this chemical attraction with people that is that, um, that opportunity that we have to, to move all of these lukewarm leads that many people have in their pipeline into these loyal customers that we know will come back to us time after time again. <clears throat> but before you can create this chemical attraction, you have to have an impactful brand. And that's what we talked about on the March webinar. So I know a lot of you were with us here for that, but if you weren't, you can go to the Allegro webinar library and the URL is here in the bottom left and you can listen in. And even if you were here with us, maybe you want to go back and uh, just refresh yourself on some of the things that we talked about because a lot of what we're going to talk about is the next step after you've created that impactful brand. So today we're going to talk about how to move from creating an impactful brand into one that has an irresistible chemical attraction. And because this is how we add maturity to the relationship. And so what we wanna do is start with that impact that we have and move it into that next step and look at how we create that attraction that we have with audiences and moving them through that decision process and converting them into customers in ways that are less labor and cost intensive in that sales process and ends up giving us a more loyal and a richer customer relationship after the, after the fact, after they become our customers. So we hear so much today about customer journeys and customer experience and experience design. And by the end of this hour, I want it to be super clear for all of you about why this matters so much and what you can actually start doing today, like as soon as we're done with this webinar, that will start to make a difference in the number of conversions and the rate of customer retention that you have. Because all of this, when you understand it, it helps you be more strategic in the decisions that you make. And it also makes you better at reporting things in a way that is understandable to other people in your organization. So if you're in sales, if you're in marketing, 
there's a lot of times we talk about what we do in a language that other people don't understand and especially to upper management so what we'll cover today is really going to help that make help make it easier for you to have those conversations so <clears throat> we're actually going to start out with an exercise and uh, there's there's going to be a little bit of work on your end with this webinar today but what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that it's saturday morning and you have the entire day ahead of you and as part of this day you're going to eat lunch out with a friend and what i want you to do is just take a couple of minutes right now and write down a list of all the things that you would go through the whole day that includes lunch and it's also going to um, include things that you do before and after lunch so for an example i wrote down what a typical saturday might look for me look like for me and i started from the time i wake up until you can see on the very bottom on the right until i go to bed and what i want you to do is you can take some notes in your computer you can write it on a piece of paper you have handy you know if you're at lunch write it on a napkin, you know, put some notes in your phone because you're going to look back and you're going to use this list for the rest of the hour. So that's why I want you to have it some. So I'm going to quit talking for a couple of minutes while you write some notes down. Okay, so do you have your lists ready? Because next what I want you to do is take a piece of paper <clears throat> and I want you to turn it sideways, turn it horizontal. So right through the middle of it, I want you to draw a line just like this. And then in the area above the line, I want you to put a plus sign and the area below it, I want you to put a minus sign. So just like it looks, this is positive and negative. And now with the list of activities that you wrote down in the slide before, what I want you to do is think about whether that was a positive experience or a negative experience. And then I want you to draw it out over time. So emotionally positive or emotionally negative. So for example, here's what my Saturday looks like. If I put lunch in the middle of my day, <clears throat> and I looked at, okay, what, what things were positive and what things were negative. And I look at, okay, well, I wake up. So that wasn't so, <laughs> that, that was kind of a negative experience because maybe I wanted to sleep in. But then it gets positive. You know, I check the weather. It's going to be a great day. I go for a run. I had, oh, came back for breakfast and maybe there wasn't any, you know, breakfast left over. Um, I confirmed lunch with my friend. So I was looking forward to that. Oh, I had to remind the kids to do the chores. Saturdays are chore days and that's never fun. <clears throat> then I had to drive to the mall and it's traffic, you know, but then I had my lunch with my friend. I had to go grocery shopping, you know, there's all these ups and downs with things. So that's what I want you to do is, is to map that all out. Because across this spectrum, what I want you to see are all of the things that are around and involved with the relationship between how we make a purchase. Because as marketers, what we tend to do is that we look at this customer journey and we do one of three things. We either don't map the journey at all, or we do what these red dots show. We, mo we map it at such a micro point that it feels overwhelming and there's nothing that we can do that lets us feel like this is a manageable situation. And the last thing, the third thing is we map it too small. We look at just the customer journey and we don't really pay attention to you know these other influences that we have and so what we have to do is start to look at this in a in a broader spectrum we we have to go beyond just the buyer journey and we have to look at the complete customer now the consulting firm mckinsey says that when you look closely at the customer journey they're actually circular they're not linear like what we just drew out and the journey starts with something that triggered people to go on a journey and what motivated them, motivated them to take an action. And then once they bought for you, from you, they go into what they call this loyalty loop. And this loyalty loop is what you really want to focus on and that because that's where the loyalty from your customers come. 
But if the inspiration that inspires somebody to act is what turns one of these lukewarm leads into somebody who buys something and then puts them into that loyalty loop. Now I put the URL at the bottom left of the slide. If you'd like to go, there's a great explanation of McKinsey's approach to this and the loyalty loop that I think you'd really find um, interesting to read. So I just wanted to share that with you. Now, this is how I want you to take this into consideration when you look at the rest of your day. So what experience do you have on your hypothetical Saturday that can put you into a loyalty loop? Because here's, here's an example of a company that is phenomenal at this. And of course, we've all heard of Disney and Disney has an amazing reputation for customer experience and customer journey. But there's something that Disney is really great at that a lot of people don't realize when they have appreciation for the brand. So there was a family who went to Disney and Kelly Gretz Rassarin was the mom and her little boy was Wes. Now they had saved money for a long time to go to Disney and Wes was just over the moon to meet Woody because his favorite toy was Slinky and he loved the Toy Story movies. Woody was his favorite toy and on the very last day, he asked his parents if he could get another toy because he'd really been a great kid while they were at Disney. So they bought him a Slinky dog to go along with his Woody. But as they were, you know, ending their day and everybody was tired, they sat down on a bench to rest and then they got up to leave the park and they didn't realize it, but her husband had forgotten Woody on, um, Woody and Slinky on the bench. And so they didn't realize it until they were on the drive home. And when they realized it, Wes was devastated. So when they got home, Kelly called the park and she asked if somebody had turned it in. And, you know, they said, you know, there's nothing here in Lost and Found, but we'll keep an eye out for it and we'll see what we can do. And the mom was worried. She was sad. She was so mad that it had even gotten left behind because she knew that Slinky was such an important toy. And so what she did is she waited. And the next day, Disney called back. Somebody from Customer Care called back. And they said, you know what? We have found Slinky and he'll be home in about 10 days. So that she was really happy to be able to tell her son that. And then when the package arrived from Disney, it was beyond what she could have imagined because not only did, did they send back Slinky, they sent back this photo, um, photo journey of what Slinky had done once he'd gotten left behind at Disney. So you can see he's there with Woody on a, on a trampoline. He's um, there playing games. He's uh, here, they're hiding out on one of the shelves with the other stuffed animals. Here he's on a bench, you know, here he's hanging out. And it's all these different things. He had an amazing adventure. And then what Disney did is they wrote this great note that felt very personal to Wes. And so what he saw is that they took this time to create this note because they had compassion for West and this, you know, e emotional trauma that this little boy had felt while he was waiting for his favorite toys to come home. So along with this, Disney also sent another Woody doll, they sent a Slinky, and they sent this bucket of soldiers because they wanted to make sure that everything was a great experience for for Wes and for his family. Now, Disney was fabulous in what they had done. And if we mapped this whole customer journey for Wes and Kelly and their family, it would look something like this. And you see the huge, huge negative situation there when he lost his toy and how it turned into such a positive one once it re was returned. Because Disney was brilliant in how they handled this situation. Because let's face it, kids lose stuff all the time. But Disney doesn't have any control of that but they do know that situations like this can have a huge impact on how families perceive their visit to Disneyland. So they took this opportunity to turn this customer experience fail into an incredibly positive, like a sailing experience. So my question for you is how can you turn one of your customers worst nightmares into a powerful sale experience? You know, that's what creates the chemical attraction. So if we go back to our Saturday lunch experience, think about all of those opportunities on a Saturday that companies have to create these Disney moments for you. What are your daily opportunities for Disney moments? So it's really important because this is where we begin to feel, you know, feel the feels of our own emotional journey as customers, because that's how we start to connect with our customer's journey. 
So what's happening for the customers of our companies? So we're not looking at the big picture of what they experience and what our role is and the brand has in their interaction because most of the time we just focus on the sales funnel. And that means we're not able to answer these other important questions like, why does it take us so long to close a sale? Or why do we have so much customer churn? And it's because that chemical reaction we're aiming for is this shooting star of a conversion. And shooting stars burn super bright, but only for a very short period of time. And delivering that kind of experience isn't what builds relationships sooner to attract customers or makes them want to stay after they bought something from us. What we have to look at is how do we build this fire that keeps attracting people over time. And I know, Tiffany, I covered a lot there in just a short amount of time. So I wanted to take a minute and take a quick break and see if we have any questions. Thanks. Yeah, actually, we did have one come in. So you've talked a little bit about the buyer journey and the customer journey, but can you explain the difference between the two? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's that's a really good question because it's a big distinction that many companies, many people don't understand and it makes a big difference in, in the relationship that you have with customers. So the buyer's journey is starts at the point when somebody has decided they're going to start on a path of looking to make a purchase. They are an identified buyer. So that's the top of the funnel. They're aware of the brand. They're moving through the, the qualification process, you know, is, you know, um, do they understand my problem? Is this the right product? How much does it cost? You know, to that point of conversion. But a customer journey is much bigger. And a customer journey, even if we look at our simple scenario, like our lunch on Saturdays, you know, there's a lot of restaurants who may have an opportunity to provide a great experience dur during our customer journey, even something like, um, uh, here are other places that you can park at the mall on Saturday in case your usual place is, um, you know, is busy or traffic routes or, you know, um, sending notes ahead of time, maybe a text message that says, uh, um, do you have a reservation? We have unusually high traffic or, you know, something like that. There's all these opportunities to help move me along as a customer that goes beyond just me making a buying decision. So, um, you know, maybe there's an opportunity for them to say, hey, do you wanna make something similar like this at home? Here's the recipe if you wanna go to your, you know, if you're gonna go to your grocery store, or here's, you know, five meals that you can make with five ingredients in 30 minutes or less, or, or something like that. So the customer journey is more about how does the piece of, that's your product or service fit into the bigger lifestyle of your customer. And that's the same whether your customer is a consumer, business to consumer customer, or a business to business customer. All right, thank you. Um, we don't have any right now, so you can continue on. Okay. Okay. So this is, now I, I'm talking about this a lot because this is really important. This idea of being able to map the ups and downs of your customer journey it tells you a great deal about the opportunities that you have as a brand to step in and really um, motivate action and kind of um, poke the pain so, so to speak to get people to start moving because one of the things that we hear a lot in marketing is that we have to be more emotional about what it is that we do so when we talk about emotion what we're looking at is yes does the customer feel positive, negative? Are they angry? Are they happy? Are they frustrated? Like, what is that emotion? Because we need to understand that first before we can start moving to that next part, and that's having empathy for our customer. So today we're talking about how to create this impactful, you know, moving from creating an impactful brand to one that has this irresistible chemical attraction. Because this is how we start to add maturity to the relationship that we have with audiences and moving them along this decision process and then converting them into customers. So if you want to dig deeper into how you build that emotion naturally in your brand and in your marketing, I'm going to point you back to the last webinar again because we covered how to do exactly that. And it would be really helpful in understanding that as you look at this role that emotion plays in building empathy and how brands can use emotion to build relationships with customers 
in a really authentic way and not in a way that feels manipulative because there's a big difference. Customers and audiences, they can really sense that difference. So <clears throat> the shift that we get here is what gets customers excited about doing business with us. And this is what builds the deeper relationships that matter to customers because it's you walking the talk of putting customers at the heart of everything that you do. So when you have empathy for your customers, they understand that you care more about them and helping them first than you do about just purely getting a sale. And this is how you start to move the needle and you shorten the sales cycle. And this is how you build that loyalty and not only retain them as customers, but shift them into these higher value and these revenue generating customers. Because as you understand these touch points along the way that really matter the most to your customers, you'll start to identify more opportunities to help them in ways that you never imagined that are incredibly valuable to them. And if you're a brand that delivers incredible value to your customers, they're going to be somebody who is going to come back again and again and again to, um, to do business with you. So I'll give you a quick example here. I was in Europe last fall for work and I was flying to a conference in San Francisco and I had to do, I had something that I had to get printed and get ready the day I was, the day I landed. So my designer was busy and I tried to just cobble something together and send it off to a print company in San Francisco and they had great customer reviews. So, I mean, that was one thing. And the other thing is that it was a huge sense of urgency and they understood that. So, and so what I did is I emailed them what I needed done and then they emailed back with a couple of questions that they had. And to be honest, I just kind of closed my eyes and I crossed my fingers that everything was going to turn out all right. And, and then when I landed, I dropped my things at my hotel and then I ran down the street to the print company and lo and behold, I had not submitted things right. And this was the night before he needed everything. But what the print company had done is that they completely redesigned everything because they knew I needed it and they knew it was important. And because they were more than simply a copy shop, they were a print company and they had the expertise to make it right for me and they totally saved me. So they had two qualities that created a tremendous chemical attraction for me. One was quality and things looked fabulous. And the other was trust. And I've used them on other projects since then because they were my Disney when I needed one the most. And I tell this story over and over again. And I know I'm rambling on here, but I still get worked up because I love what a fabulous experience that I had. And this is what helps you shorten the sales cycle. Because as you understand exactly what triggered people on a journey, just like McKinsey talked about, when you understand what happens, you have the chemical attraction. And whether it's trust or quality or whatever that emotional driver is for your customers, this is how you make sure that you keep customers in the loyalty loop. So let me show you an example of a company that does this really, really well. And many of us have this company in our wallet or in our purse, you know, Visa, the credit card company. I had interviewed their former CMO, Antonio Lucio, about their approach to marketing a couple of years ago. And he said that when they stopped looking at individual transactions and they started looking at, at this comprehensive customer journey, it made a huge difference in the growth of their business. And let me show you what he meant. So Visa mapped its customer journey and they looked at all the decision points that a person makes when like when planning a vacation for example that's what i've mapped out here <clears throat> so doing this helped them understand how they could move beyond the straight credit card transaction and into the lifestyle type of partner so you see here um, before what they had the focus on was just the point of a transaction when did people pull a visa card out of their wallet out of their purse and actually pay for something. But now what they looked at is what's the entire journey that somebody takes when they may use their credit card and now how can they start to deliver value before and after that to create a more loyal relationship. So this was how they could show up and how they could be helpful in all of these different moments that they hadn't even thought about before. 
Now, once we understand this, this customer journey and really how much bigger our opportunities are, we can move into thoughtfully designing specific experiences for customers. Now, I, I sometimes, I, I am careful when I talk about experience design because sometimes it totally freaks people out because they think it's going to be super hard. And believe me, trust me, it's not as hard as, as either you have the impression it may be or as some people may lead you to think because you are all, you all know more about experience design than you think you do because you are all consumers of it all day long. And when we look at what's the experiences that you have that make you take action, that, that trigger you from these lukewarm leads into loyal customers, this is what I want you to think about. So experience design, it's more than the user experience, the user interface of a product or service. I think of it as what's the entire experience that somebody has with a brand and what opportunities do we have to actually design those interactions? And experiences, we know they can be either online, I mean, we hear everything everywhere we turn about digital transformation and digital marketing and digital this and digital that, but there's so much with this human and, and emotion and empathy that's brought with the offline relationships and then being able to connect those both together. That's, that's a huge thing that we need to look at how we connect. Um, experience design includes context because you have to look at what the situation is with a particular person, a particular persona, and what it is that they're trying to accomplish. So you can design that experience thoughtfully. And it takes the 360 degree view of um, what matters most to a customer. And that's why we need to map that customer journey first. And then, and this is really great, how when you start to bring experience design into your organization, the interesting thing is how it starts to break down silos within a company and it builds internal collaboration and understanding. Because even as much as sales and marketing people know about a customer, there are so many other elements that we have to bring into play that we can't do it without collaborating with other departments. You know, generally, IT, perhaps purchasing, you know, there's probably HR involved if we're recruiting people who are going to be customer service representatives, you know, how do we handle the experience of, of paying bills and, and things like that. That's all part of experience design. But the most important thing to know is that all of this can start with small steps. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. So that's what I want you to remember is that it's a lot of little small steps can add up to a huge difference in what you do. Now, when we look at this, we're back to the customer being at the heart of everything we do when we design cust when we design an experience. And what we have to look at is not just what happens in this one particular instance and in how do we design the, the experience that we're having, but ask ourselves, okay, where is somebody coming from as a customer at, but before they have this experience? Because that gives us context. And then with this experience, where do we want them to go to after this? And you may have people come into this particular experience from two or three different places or channels, and you may have two or three or four or five different places they can go after this. But it's important that you really understand where they are in their bigger journey and have empathy for their situation. Because when we look at these individual touch points, we wanna make sure that we understand where they came from and where they're going to, so you don't leave them just hanging. I mean, there's lots of, there's, we see this in content development a lot of times. It's, it's like you make people walk the plank. You get them to a particular situation and you give them something and then there's nowhere else to go and, and they're just left hang, hanging. So one thing that we can do to really understand as we start to design these experiences is a great tool that is an empathy map. So with an empathy map, what is it that a person does in these four different quadrants? And you can see it here. What is it that they say, they think, they feel, and they do? So if we're looking at this from our example of, of going to lunch, what we're going to look at, okay, what does a person say when they're going to lunch? Okay, what do you think? You know, where would you go? What kind of menu? What's the parking like? What do they think? You know, they're thinking, okay, is the menu healthy? Do they have dessert? Oh, I can't wait to relax. You know, where can I run errands afterwards? Okay, 
What do they feel? Um, you know, I'm happy to get together with my friend. Oh, I'm pleased with the place that we, you know, that we went to. Oh, I'm so angry about all of this traffic and I'm confused and frustrated. I don't know where to park. You know what, at this restaurant, I really feel cared for. And then what is it because of all of this? What do they do? So, you know, they make small, multiple decision, they, decisions. They ask friends for input. They look for reviews, they, you know, look at Google Maps. What's the best way to get to the mall? Um, observes the staff at the restaurant. So these are important things because what it does is, is as we look at experience design, this gives us a 360 degree view of how we need to look at our customer and what it is that we want to create. Now, once you have this empathy map, the next thing that you want to do is start asking some questions. So you're going to ask yourself, who are my customers? Who are the people that I'm targeting? You know, what really matters to them? What do they want? Do they want information? Do they want entertainment? Um, do they want to make a decision? What is it that they're wanting to get out of this particular experience? Next, what is it that they feel? And that's where empathy maps really come into play because it helps people dig into feelings and emotions in ways that can sometimes be comfortable for people within companies to talk about because, you know, feelings are kind of squidgy and, and that's sometimes taboo to talk about in a corporate environment. Um, feelings are for your personal life, they're not for business. And this is a, a tool to help you have some of those conversations in a way that's more comfortable. Then the next thing is, okay, where did they come from? That's our putting our customer at the heart of the experience. Where did they come from? Because that also gives us context into what part of this experience matters the most and what do we need to focus on? And then where do they want to go next? And part of this can also be helpful in you creating a rich experience that can serve many potential audiences or personas at the same time when you understand all of this because you may have many different types of people coming into the same experience and you want to take that into consideration as you look at what your priorities are. So then knowing all of this, how do you start to demonstrate and deliver value through these particular experiences? So that's what we wanna look at. Now, as we look at an example of this, this is a company called Fruit View. And they are, um, it's an app, and it's an application for employees who work for the Dutch Institute of Health and Environment. And I found this just a phenomenal, simple app that was really helpful to this company because it's a project that was aimed to stimulate employees and improve their healthy eating habits. And they can do this, the employees can do this just simply by ordering fruit with this little app. And what they looked at when they built this experience, this digital online experience, was that it was fast and that it was super user friendly. So that was key. Now, what users do is that they get a push notification every day and then that prompts them to order fruit for the next day. And then the orders deliver to wherever they are. So if they want fruit delivered to their office the next day, then that's where it shows up. If they want it, you know, delivered to home after work, that's where it shows up. So then they have it. So the amount is automatically deducted from, you know, a, the user's account and it helps them understand their balance. It can see their purchase history. It can, you know, they can see, are, am I overbuying, underbuying, how much fruit and healthy vegetables am I actually consuming? So this is really important because they did a fabulous job of connecting this online and the offline experience because this connecting between online and offline experience is key. It is so important because the major part of how to build this chemical attraction is making sure that you feel like the same, like one single company to people. Because I know, I feel like I do this all the time in a, in a medical environment. You know, I'll um, call up and I'll make an appointment and they'll ask for all sorts of information. And then I get to the doctor's office and I have to give them the exact information. And then, you know, um, maybe I go to another branch of the same medical facility and I have to give all the same information. And I, you know, I do that at some retail stores and I'm thinking, you know, this is ridiculous. You know, why, why can't what I, experience online be tied into what happens offline and 
why do I walk into a store and it's, you know, like they have no clue that I'm a, a loyal buyer of the brand. This ability to connect online and offline experiences is so important because it makes your customers feel important. And that's what matters to a customer that you are putting them at the heart of everything that you do. So that's the key thing that I want you to remember that comes out of this customer journey is that you'll start to connect dots that you didn't realize were interrelated in ways that add a tremendous amount of value. And then what you can do is once you identify those points, then you can bring out the ones that you feel are most important to your customer and you can start to prioritize them. So if we didn't see in the Disney example, the likelihood of kids losing a toy at the park, Disney would never have thought that that could be a major opportunity for a touch point and, and to create a chemical attraction. But because they had mapped out the whole journey, they understood that that was a big part of, of what could happen while someone was there visiting. And that's what I want you to think about, are what are these opportunities to create these touch points and, and connect the journey, both online and off, that you have an opportunity to do that you haven't paid attention to otherwise. Okay, now at the beginning of the webinar, I said there was one secret tip that I was gonna share, and I'm not kidding you, this is absolute biggest question, most consistent question I get from anybody, whether it's consumer companies, or B2B companies, and it's how do you inspire that dead-end buyer? And I have friends at uh, Corporate Visions, and they are a company that helps with sales messaging, and they shared a really interesting statistic with me, and that's that 60% of B2B sales that are lost aren't lost to competitors. So that means if you, yeah, if you ultimately hear a no from somebody and you're a B2B salesperson or you're in B2B marketing, it's probably not because they bought from somebody else. And it's because they just decided that the pain of the current situation is less than the perceived pain of change. That's why most of these sales end in no decision rather than deciding to buy from someone else. Now, there's a psychological term for this and it's called cognitive dissonance. And it's this discomfort that people feel when they have two thoughts that don't align with each other. And when people feel this, they either change what they believe to make themselves feel better, or they're making, they make excuses about why they don't need to change. And we see this a lot with um, people who are, uh, like with New Year's resolutions, this is one of the reasons that New Year's resolutions, you know, about getting healthy or going to the gym don't last beyond the end of January is because it's the conflicting thought of, ah, oh, this is really hard and, oh, I want to get into shape. You know, it's, it's easy to explain things away. And that's the exact same thing that help, happens with these dead-end buyers is that they're, they're reconciling this cognitive dissonance by saying, ah, oh, the situation really isn't that bad after all. So what's happening is that there's a huge emotional toll that happens because when we start out and we're looking at just this small part of their journey what fits into this buyer journey that that we you know understand now the difference between the buyer journey and the customer journey so instead of looking at this bigger customer journey we miss all of these opportunities to serve them so we don't understand the emotional toll that happens when people are feeling like they should make a decision, but that perceived pain of making a decision is greater than the pain they have with whatever's wrong right now. So here are four questions that you can ask that start to move these prospects in a direction of either saying, nope, I'm not going to do it, or yes, let's move forward and figure out if, you know, if, if there's something you can do to help us. Okay. The first question is, how long have you had this problem? And that's an important question because if this is a problem that came up last night and they're calling you about it right now, there's some sort of sense of urgency. If this is a problem that they've had for a couple of years, I would be pretty suspect as to why is it now that they say they want to make a change if they've been living this way for you know a couple of years. They probably figured out quite a few workarounds with it. Okay, the next one is what have you done to try and fix it? because maybe they've tried things 
and they either just didn't, didn't do them right or they didn't invest enough into solving the problem fully. Like maybe they weren't willing to commit budget to really fix the problem. Um, and maybe they said, you know, we really haven't done anything. It's just been, you know, wrong for two years or, you know, it's an emergency right now. We, ha we have to figure out what, you know, what to do and try and fix it. And that's why we need your help. So this also gives us a sense of urgency that helps us understand why they haven't made a decision yet. Okay. Now the third one is important. What happens if you don't do anything? Now this goes back to the empathy map also, because what we're looking at is, okay, will your company shut down? Will people get laid off? Uh, will you just kind of be, you know, is it kind of like a sandpaper? Is it just going to be something that's super irritating um, and inconvenient? Or is it really something that's ca causing a problem? And then the fourth one, this really hits home, is how does this make you feel? Now, this is important because this goes even deeper into our empathy situation because we understand, are you scared about what's going to happen? Are you concerned you'll lose your job? Are you, um, you know, worried that it may hurt your career? You know, what's the emotional impact of doing or not doing something? And the really important thing to realize is that as you slowly talk through the answers to these questions, by the time you ask the question, how does that make you feel? People are really pretty willing to tell you how that makes them feel. And that's an important part because it's that emotional toll that helps you understand what's the pain that they have that you can now understand as a part of their customer journey because now you have the full complete information as to what the risk is, what the reward is, and what's it going to take for that trigger point when we talk about the McKinsey loyalty loop to get them moving and what's going to keep them into that loyalty loop. Because this is the same kind of situation that, you know, that I had, that um, Wes as the Disney visitor had, and so many of you have had, is the emotional toll of making or not making these decisions that's so important. So as we just wrap up, and I know we have some time for questions, what I wanna cover is there's a really simple process that you can follow, and like I said, you can do this this afternoon, you can do this as soon as we get off our webinar, is just go through the process and think about your own customer's journeys and think about it beyond just the buying process. And that can be hard to step out of that mindset. But think about this from the outside in. Map the highs and the lows of your customer's journey. Then look at those points that really matter most to them because we don't have time to do everything perfectly, but we have, to, we have time to do a few things really, really well, and that's what people will really remember us for. Then start to design that experience from the outside in. What matters to the customers? And then how can you start to collaborate with other people within your organization to make sure that it's a truly cohesive online and offline experience? And then always remember that once this is done, once you've designed an experience, you have to consistently refine it. There's so much information that we can have about, you know, we can do surveys and there's all sorts of data collection, but also just asking your customers, you know, we tried this, we, you know, wanted to see how it worked. What do you think about it? And just spend some time in their world and see what they feel about it and get their feedback and just keep refining it and making it better and better. So, this was great. And I know, like I said, we covered a lot in a short amount of time and uh, we're ready for any questions. So I'll turn it back to you, Tiffany. All right. Thank you, Carla. I think it's really easy to get so focused on the conversion that we often forget to consider what inter other interactions people are having with our brand at other points of the journey. So thinking about it this way really allows us to begin building that relationship before they even become a customer. So when you are thinking about developing experiences that connect both online and offline, it's a good idea to map out the experience that a person has with your brand and then determine how they connect. So when you think of marketing tactics as experiences, where do they fall within the awareness, consideration, purchase, retention, and advocacy parts of the journey? Are those tactics all aligned? It can be a really daunting process to put all of this together. And that's really where Allegra comes in. We are your local single source that can be a partner on both planning and executing the tactics that fit on your customer journey. 
We take a strategic approach to create a plan that includes tactics like branded collateral, targeted direct mail, paid search campaigns, personalized promotional items, point of purchase displays, and more. And as you're working towards building longer lasting relationships with your prospects and customers, consider Allegra as your partner so that you don't have to go at it alone. So it does look like we've had a few questions come in for Carla, so I'm going to take a few minutes to go over some of those. And I want to start with, is there something different to consider for nonprofit marketers with donors? Uh, consider as far as the customer journey? Is there a little more clarification on that question? Yes, I believe as far as the customer journey. So for nonprofit marketers, anything different on the customer journey they need to be considering with donors? You know, I've worked with many nonprofits, and here's what I find with nonprofits is that they look at um, what they're not considering is the amount of um, emphasis that they can put on the emotional engagement with, with their donors and looking at more at the value that they can talk about. So there is a nonprofit in, um, I think it's in Minneapolis, it's called Be The Match. And one of the things that they did with understanding the customer journey of their donors is that they are a, um, a nonprofit that focuses on bone marrow um, transplants. And if you've ever known anybody who's had a bone marrow transplant or you know had a done donation or anything like that, it's it's an incredibly painful process. And they really struggled with um, donors to come in and donate bone marrow. And so what they looked at is that they start they looked at the customer journey of a potential of a potential donor, and they said, well. One thing that the target donors for us are young men like 18 to 24, I think, I think it was, something around in that range. And they said, one thing that we see is we go through like a customer journey and, and what matters to these people is, is being able to share on social media things that they do that are making a difference to the world. So instead of talking about, um, you know, he, here's somebody else that has received a donation and how their life has changed, it felt too disconnected for them. So they started to target this group of young men by talking about, you could be the man who saves this life. You could be the man who, like you have the power to make a difference in the world and in the lives of, of people, like so many people that you wouldn't have ever imagined. And they did this campaign called be the man, and it was targeted toward different social media channels because they knew that's where their target audience, you know, in a customer journey spent time. And so I think sometimes with um, nonprofits, they don't always understand the way to position the message in the customer journey in a way that delivers the most value to their audience. And I imagine this question comes from the point of view of financial donors. But whether it's financial donors or, in, you know, in this case, it was um, donors of a specific thing that they needed from a healthcare perspective. It's also what you have to keep in mind is, is what is it that matters to that donor on that journey that creates that perceived value, however you define value, in a way that creates a trigger to get them to take action. So that's what I would say is, is really looking at what matters to your target audience, your target customer from the outside in and putting them at the heart of it? Because I think a lot of nonprofits tend to put themselves at the heart of things and customers all around them. All right, thank you. So we got a couple that actually kind of go together here. Um, so how do you know about your prior and post experiences with the brand? And also, if, they're, if we're turning sales into sales, how are we supposed to know about the sales if they don't tell us? Okay, uh, so I'm going to break that up into two questions. So what was it? Can you repeat the first question again? Sure. It says, how do you know the prior and post experiences with your brand? So uh, when we talk about, when I talk about what happens before is um, looking at, it, and it doesn't have to be the last time they engaged with your company. It should be the last action they took before the specific experience you want to design right now. So in some cases, it can be what was the last interaction they should have had with your company. So it could be 
um, with the salesperson, okay, if we want to design the easiest online, you know, purchase request or to be able to look at your, um, your, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a purchase decision or a history of what you've bought with a company or, or something, if they're coming from sales into this purchase experience, you want to know what happened in the sales situation because that makes a difference in the decisions that you make in the actual purchase situation. And then once they've made the purchase, where do they go from, from there? So when I talk about previous experience, it doesn't necessarily have to be that customer's previous experience with your brand if you don't already know it. But what you want to understand is what's the previous experience they had in their journey to make this decision at this time. Just like as we talk about, you know, what's your, what happens before you get to the mall to meet your friend for lunch? You know, what's that bigger journey? And then what was the second part of the question? Um, it kind of went along with that, but it was if we're supposed to turn these sales into sales, how, how do we know about the sales if they don't tell us? Uh, you know what? I bet there are many opportunities to find out that you wouldn't imagine. One is um, ask them. You know, there's lots of companies who, if you, if you would just ask your customers, what could we do to, to make things better? They'll tell you. Um, you can send out surveys. I had a client one time who did a customer survey, and one of the biggest feedbacks they got from customers was, why do I get five different bills from five different areas of your company? Why can't I just get one invoice that has everything on it together? So, you know, and had they not done the survey, they probably wouldn't have heard it. Um, have your salespeople ask. Um, listen on social media. There's lots of times people will share things on social media um, when, they're, when they aren't happy. And um, I think being a, a company that continually asks whether you hear things right away, that will help you understand what those fails are. Um, they may not tell you right away, but the more you ask and the more consistently you ask, the more likely they are to tell you. And then also, once you hear something, you have to give them feedback about what was done about it because that gives them the trust that what they share with you is actually something that's going to make a difference. Okay, great. So another one came in says, where would multiple customer personas fit with the mapping of the journey? Uh, okay. And that's actually part of what we're going to cover in the next webinar that we do, the, the third webinar. Um, what we look at is who's involved in a purchase decision and how do you start to create the, the touch points that serve those people. So when you look at a customer journey, and you can take this based on what we've done right here in this webinar, what you can do is if you write down all of the decision points along the way that happens in a purchase point in a in a purchase process um, or in a customer journey what you say is okay we know these 10 things happen okay if we look at point number one we know this one person is involved because we map their customer journey now who else is involved for example I'm going to use um, uh, like a director of IT for an example <clears throat> because I do a lot of work with technology companies so there may be an IT director who is having a challenge and he starts, he or she starts to do a web search about, you know, here's this problem I'm, I'm having in my company. Maybe it's a productivity problem. Um, what happens there? And then next he reports up to his boss because one of the things that she really cares about is what's the overall productivity and output of, of the team because what they're always looking at is how can we support more people internally than we thought. Okay, well you've right now added another person into that customer journey so you have another persona. Um, then it might be maybe a CEO who says, you know what, I want reports from every, you know, every department about um, how what you do contributes to the bigger business objectives. Okay, so now you have a CEO, you have maybe a, a VP, and you have a director, um, and then uh, maybe the um, VP says, okay, we're going to put out an RFP for a software platform to help us, you know, with productivity. 
And so maybe the director drops out then and you know, you'll see people come and go when you start to map out the journeys. And one thing that you need to pay attention to when you map out the journeys are even people like administrative assistants, uh, purchasing people, um, because it's important to be able to target the people who can say yes to whatever it is that you have to sell. But it's also super, super important to be able to identify the people who can say no and kill every decision. That's really important. And so when you, when you map out that customer journey and you really think about what is it that this person's day is like or you know, their job is like, then you'll start to see the influences of these other personas and that will help you understand maybe what additional content do we need to create either for that audience directly or for our customer who's on this journey to read, consume, and then turn around and explain to these other people or share with these people, but help them help other people make decisions as well. Okay, and this is the last one we have so far. So how would you rank your interactions based on the value of the customer? So for example, the Disney solution may not be appropriate for a smaller company with a lower average sale. And what was the first part of the question? How do you rank the? Your, yeah, how would you rank your interaction based on the value of the customer? Well, I think, um, so I'm not quite sure what you mean by the value of the customer. So I'm gonna answer it with some assumptions and I'll explain them. When you look at mapping out customer journeys, when you look at, if you're looking at, um, if you alter, if this company all serves a same kind of similar type of customer, what you wanna do is start out by looking at who are your highest value customers. So I'm going to use that assumption when, when they ask about the value of the customer. Um, and then what was the first part of that question again? How would you rank your interactions based on the value of the customer? Okay, so when you rank the interactions, what you wanna look at is based on the customers that are the most valuable to you. And by most valuable, I mean how um, that generate the most revenue and also have a um, high lifetime customer value. So they they generate a lot of revenue over a long period of time. They aren't a customer that just comes in once, bought a lot, and then left. So you wanna, you wanna take those into consideration. So when you rank the interactions, you wanna start out by mapping the customer journey of the most high value customers that you have. And then what you wanna look at is, and you may need to sit down with some of these customers, especially if it's a small company, sit down with them and explain what they're doing, what you're doing, and have them help you identify what those top priority points of contact are. Because believe me, every customer wants to help you make it easier for them to do business with you. Because if you can make it easy for somebody to do their job, you're absolutely golden. So there's probably some main, main points of, uh, main touch points that you can look at. Okay, definitely the point of purchase. You know, is it long drawn out? Is it very cumbersome? Is it paperwork intensive? Um, are your uh, people involved with the direct purchase, are they easy to work with? Are they helpful or are they proactive? You know, um, if it's a service that you have to then onboard, you know, once, once they make the, the purchase, how easy, easy is it for them to start using it or, or for them to get that first product from you or, or whatever it may be. But I would say understanding how to rank them depends on what matters to those specific customers. So I can say what may matter to a customer in an IT environment, but it can be completely different from what may matter to this particular customer. But that's the important part is understanding how to rank them goes back to what's important to them and mapping that journey and understanding the opportunities you have that are bigger than the buyer's journey that matter to your customers where you can start to add value. And that's what Visa really started to understand. All right, that's great. So that's all the questions that we have for today. And I wanna thank everybody that sent one in. Um, and I also just to look, like to remind everyone that by registering for today's webinar, you are already signed up for our next webinar on September 26th. So during this webinar, Carla will wrap up our webinar series for 2019 by making you rethink the way you look at building a business. She'll show you how to rally all the people on, and teams who make or break a customer relationship. 
And if you know anyone else that would benefit from this information, please feel free to share the www.allegrawebinars.com link with them so they can register for the remainder of the series. So thank you all again for joining us today, and I hope you've taken down some action items that really make a difference as you work to turn your list of leads into a list of customers. If you need additional support, please contact your local expert at Allegra. But if you are already working with us, you can find your nearest partner by visiting www.allegramarketingprint.com. So thank you again, Carla, and we hope everybody has a wonderful day.